Hey, good morning everyone and welcome to the 2012 edition of the Royal Tyrrell Museum Speaker Series. Today, the Royal Tyrrell Museum and its cooperating society are proud to present our very own Dr. Don Henderson. Don is the curator of dinosaurs at the Royal Tyrrell Museum, where he has worked for the past five years. Don obtained his undergraduate degree at the University of Toronto in Geology and Physics. He came to Alberta to take courses in paleontology and zoology at the University of Calgary and to work as a technician here at the Terrell Museum during the summers of 1994 and 1995. Subsequently, Don went to the University of Bristol in England to pursue his PhD in vertebrate paleontology, studying uh, theropod gait through computer models. Don then moved to the U.S. to hold a postdoctoral fellowship at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine in Baltimore, Maryland, after which he returned to the University of Calgary as a research associate and sessional instructor in biological sciences. Then, in 2006, Don joined the curatorial staff here at the Royal Tyrrell Museum. Today, Don will present an update on the Suncor Ankylosaur, the armored dinosaur discovered in the Fort McMurray oil sands last spring, making the headlines around the world. He will present a series of photos of this fascinating dinosaur and discuss the difficulties associated with the removal of this 110 million year old fossil from its rocky burial. So, without further delay, I present you Dr. Don Henderson. So if Ken's got, yes, he has got his electronics in order. And so, um, as Francois said, I'm going to talk to you about this rather exceptional dinosaur. And I should say at the beginning, my name's going to be very publicly associated with specimen for a long time. And I wish I could say that I'd found it through careful deductive logic and knowing just where to look and many summers trudging through the bush and in the, up north trying to find it, but I can't. Um, it was basically given to us on a silver platter um, by, the, by the people at the Suncor Mine. And um, also, we got so much help from those people. It was absolutely amazing. And um, none of what you can, will see would have happened if it wasn't for the generosity of the Suncor people. So, so I've arranged this talk around the, the five W's. And then I realized the five W's weren't going to do it. And I needed some H's for some hows. And so it's basically who found it, where did it come from, uh, when was it alive, when was it found, how did we get it out, why is it significant. So that's going to be my theme. And I'll track this through every slide. So in case, most of the time, this goes in, for me, it goes in one eye and out the other in a talk. But I thought I'd better put it in. So who found it? It was the man on, on the right there, Sean Funk. Um, we got an uh, email on um, March 21st with some pictures showing the, one of the pieces down below. And on the 23rd, after much toing and froing because of the weather and getting to the airport, um, Darren Tankey and I were flown up on the Suncor jet um, to go and look at this thing. We flew up in the morning and came back at the end of the day. So um, Sean Funk was the shovel operator working one of these giant machines. He happened to spot a piece with these weird marks fall down the cliff after he'd moved his bucket. He told his supervisor, uh, Mike Graton, there, and the two of them agreed, yes, it's worth stopping production because money is, time is money in that place. And you know, we're so glad that they did. So all the credit. The weird thing is, Sean Funk had visited the Terrell Museum a week before. So he might have had in his subconscious a search image in his head to know what to look for. That's just one of the weird things about this story. So to find fossils, you need one of these giant machines. Um, this was the actual machine number 1605 that Sean was operating. And he spends his days, what they want to do is scoop away this overburden. It's about a 15, 20 meter layer of recent sands and gravels, well, since the last ice age, and Cretaceous rock to get down to the money layer. And this is their money layer at the base here. This is the actual tar sand layer. So they got to scrape away all this stuff. And this is this view. This, we, when we were up there, we got to go up inside the machine and 
Um, got a picture of Sean at his job there. So he, he spends his days scooping out of the cliff, turning his machine, dumping it in the bucket, and he happened to see some pieces fall down here. That's really good spotting. I'm glad he was paying attention. So that's how it was found. And this is about 2 o'clock in the afternoon on the 21st. So I just want to stress right at the beginning just how rare this thing is. So Suncor people told me they estimate they've excav excavated about 900,000 cubic meters of, of material. And you might think, where do they put it? Um, they actually just keep redistributing it inside their own pit. Um, and that actually worked against us for the finding all of the animal. But for my story here, let's say it's a million cubic meters. And to represent that, imagine a cube 100 meters all around. So 100 meters deep, wide, and thick. If you multiply 100 times 100 times 100, you get a million. If you take away the rock that encloses our fossil, I would say our animal's not very big. I think you could squeeze it into um, a one meter cube, roughly. So take, find that one meter cube in this one million cubic meters of rock. And you can see it really is one in a million. Well, after you take into account my bit of fudge factor. But I think that's one way to stress how rare it is. There's another way, if you actually look at all the things that had to happen for us to get this fossil here. Um, the, this text, this slide's going to be total text, uh, but don't worry, there's lots of pictures to follow. So the first thing is, it has to become a fossil, and it has to get from the living world into the rock. So first of all, our, and our dinosaur, whether dead or alive, it somehow had to get into a river because this thing was found in, in marine rocks. It had to get from the land, its terrestrial habitat, somewhere down to the sea. And the best option is for flowing rivers. And you'll see why later on. So it had to float down this, this stream or this river, not get caught on any wood, not get stranded on a sandbar and stuck well inland because we would never see it. That's the first two hurdles. Next, it has to make it offshore to get caught by the wind or water currents and get it carried well out to sea. Um, we estimate it must have drifted at least 200 kilometers to get to where it was buried. And all the while, while it's floating, the body cavity has to stay intact. The only way this thing could travel was by floating at the surface. Um, as soon as the body wall got punctured, the gases of decay would escape and it would go down like a stone. So it had to stay afloat for several days. If you imagine, it, say it could drift 50 kilometers a day, if it stayed afloat for four days, that would be good. It would get us 200 kilometers. And then once it finally, the body did go pop and it went to the bottom, it had to go to a place where it could be preserved. The seabed conditions had to be just right. Um, it turns out it landed in nice soft mud on the seabed. You can, on the, on the fossils in, in the back there, you can actually see the impact crater and you can see how the sediments were flipped apart as this thing hit the bottom. And it also had to go down on its back um, because that's how the armor got preserved. This thing went, sinked into the mud. The mud must have just swirled around it and settled very quickly. It was nicely, the back and the armor and the other details were pressed into the mud away from the oxygen, oxygenated water, away from scavengers. That had to happen. And this seabed had to be biologically quiet, not gr all crawling with life, which would have quickly torn it apart and digested it, or bacteria that would have just dissolved it away. Um, it had, water probably was quite nasty at depth, so large scavengers like a shark or, plesi or possible plesiosaurs couldn't pull it apart. So either it was really sealed away from the water by mud or the water conditions were not favorable for large animals. All these things had to happen and, and they worked in our favor. So the next thing is, fine, you've got a fossil. We know that there's millions of fossils sitting in the ground, but somebody has to find them. So first of all, we need Sean Funk and his sharp eyes. And he had to decide it was worth stopping his machine and getting out and going have to have a look. And this makes me wonder if it was, so this was in March, what if it was minus 35 outside or what if it was a blizzard? Would he have got out? He would probably say, nah, it's probably just a bit of wood. In fact, that's what the geology people thought they had at first, um, bits of bark. 
also, all the, all the shovel operators work day and night shift. What if it, this, thing, this shovel was operating at night? Would someone have cared? Would they have got out to find it? And this last one, this really gets me. Um, if it had drifted another 50 meters, you know, 100 plus million years ago, a little bit further, the water current was a little bit different, it would have gone outside their excavation area because they were right at their limits for their property. Well, they weren't at the true limit, but they were at their digging limit because they didn't want the bank to collapse. So this, this I think that's pretty amazing. So I just want to say a bit about the geology and geography of this find. So this is a generalized geology map of Alberta. Um, the oldest rocks we have exposed are Archean, so they're at least 2.5 billion years old. You have to go up to the edge of the shield there. Um, moving forward in time a bit, all the Rocky Mountains and associated fold belt rocks there, they're all like lower Paleozoics, um, several hundred million years old. Um, also related to that, there's Devonian exposed. So a lot of this Devonian and other Paleozoics, they do continue underneath the ground, but we don't see them at the surface. There's also, a, related to the rising of the mountains in the last 50 million years, is what, this Paleocene age, great apron of rock that's, or sand and sediment rock that's eroded out. And so that's the basic picture. Everything else you see there is Cretaceous. It tends to be late Cretaceous in the southern half and early Cretaceous in the north. And it's the early Cretaceous which is relevant to us. So here's, here we are down here, the, down in the south. Here's Fort McMurray up in the northeast. And it's about 700 kilometers away. And it was quite handy being able to fly. And if you go on Google Maps or Google Earth, um, you can actually see where this thing is. So here's Fort McMurray down here. And here's our specimen up here. You can see how it plots uh, right at the, at the limit of their property. This is Highway 63. And you think, yeah, way up north. What traffic could there be? It's only 28 kilometers away. But the traffic in the morning, like uh, people trying to get there for 7 AM, it's terrible. One day it took us 90 minutes to drive from here to the mine complex building here. The worst part is this stretch. And there's a stupid bridge where they funnel all the traffic. You think traffic chaos in the middle of nowhere in northern Alberta, twice a day. People leave work at 5 a.m. I mean, leave home at 5 a.m. to get there for a reasonable hour. Anyway, and when you're on the ground in the pit, this is what it looks like. It's a very dusty place. It's super busy, 24 hours a day, every day of the year. Um, and the creatures that rule this place are these things, these heavy haulers. Um, they're really massive, um, and the driver, you can just see the, the driver right up there in the cab. It's got limited visibility. They're extremely heavy. They don't move very fast, but they've got so much momentum, like they would run over a little car and not even notice. So, um, so partly because they're so big and so dangerous, but also they're the money. They're either ha hauling rubble, the overburden away, the, the rock they strip off, or they're har carrying ore material. So they get priority in every, situ every situation, both for safety and for logistics. And there's a million other sorts of vehicles all over the place. So when we got there, this is what we were confronted with. Um, you can see a little flag up at the top. Um, marks the, for people that working up top, you know, don't dig here. Uh, can anybody spot where it is? It's about a third of the way down. It's right there. Now, if anywhere else in the province, or probably anywhere else in the world, if you saw that and you saw a bone poking out, you would think, oh, that's nice, and walk away. Um, there's so much rock above it. How are you going to get it out? Especially if you're in the middle of nowhere, bad bush. Um, it's just almost impossible. Maybe in Dinosaur Park, you might consider it if it was feasible. But again, just because you've got bone poking out on the surface, there's no guarantee there's anything else going into the cliff. Um, especially in Dinosaur Park, we can't use mechanized stuff. There would be many weeks of tedious manual labor to get down to that. So anywhere else in the world, you'd said, forget it. But here, we had this massive industrial complex at our fingertips. So it was feasible. And we also had the information that we could see an awful lot of bone poking out down here. Um, the Suncor people are fanatical about safety. 
We had, myself, Darren Tanke, and Sue Sabrowski, when we went back in, in the last day in March, we had to do a two-day safety course. They wouldn't let us in the place until we'd done this safety course. And one of the rules is you never go closer to the base of a cliff than twice its height. So we could see from a distance there was stuff. This is what we were confronted with. So the first, because we saw all this bone down here, and the, when the shovel's working, he, he's got two haulers on either side. He dumps to this one, fills it up, and immediately starts dumping this other one, and meanwhile another one backs in. So we knew we had to deal, so dribbles would come out of the bucket on either side. So first thing we did was to get that rubble. But first, I'll show you, I'll give you a sense of what our mindset was when we went. So this is the picture that we got. Dan Spivak in resource management was sent this picture on March 21st from geologist at the mine, Steve Hill. And everybody, five of us in the museum looked at this and we all, thinking past experience from Syncrude was, yeah, it's a plesiosaur. It's got to be a flipper. Oh, I have to say one thing. This guy, Steve Hill, um, I, was, I talked to him a couple of times on the phone before we went up, and his voice started to sound familiar. And I said, did you do your undergrad at Waterloo? And he said, yes. Turns out him and I, way back in 1988, when we both had summer jobs with Geological Survey out of Ottawa, we were sent to Gaspé Peninsula to do a job, a geophysics thing, and we shared a motel room for a week. So here we are 23 years later, meeting again. That was pretty amazing. So we were given this, um, these photos, and this is what we saw. And so when, uh, when Tanky and I went up on the 23rd, we're looking at these pieces, and it just wasn't working as a plesiosaur. And so, but this, certainly my brain was, still thinking plesiosaur, ichthyosaur mode. The past 20 years, we've had 10 really nice marine reptiles come out. The preservation is amazing, and the detail. And so and when you look at, go up close, the, you can see all sorts of details, the teeth and features in the skull. So Pat Druckenmiller did an awful lot of work on this. He's like plesiosaur god now. He's in Fairbanks, Alaska. So this is what was coloring my mind and everybody else's mind. And if you think of a typical plesiosaur, it could be an ichthyosaur, but let's go with plesios. Um, this is what we were all thinking in our minds, these flippers with these densely packed bones. But if you look at the actual specimen, these, if these are bones in the hands and feet, they're not tapering and get tiny as you get down here, nor are they really interlocked. Uh, first, I was thinking, well, maybe it's immature and it's lots of cartilage, but no, it's just too regular. And if you look at another piece that was there, if these are finger and toe bones, why are they so nicely arranged with the ribs? You can see the ribs here, and then the armor plates are right in between them. So it was Tanky who said it first. He said, what if it's a dinosaur? And bing, it all made sense. And it was just such a shock. And then the more we looked, the more impressed we were. So I want to say something about reptiles and how this animal that we've got fits into the big picture. So I'm sure most people have a vague idea of what reptiles are. So modern form, it includes turtles, lizards, crocs, and we have living dinosaurs known as birds. If you ignore turtles and their weird shells, turtles are actually quite close to the basic reptile pattern. So we'll keep them off to the side, but all these animals have what's for one feature is dry scaly skin. And then there's a big split within all the other rep living reptiles. You've got one group called the Lepidosauromorpha. That includes lizards and snakes. And our current best thinking is that ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs are somehow related to lizards and snakes. They parted company over 200 million years ago, and they've evolved very differently. But ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs are certainly not part of the other group known as archosauromorphs. That includes crocs and dinosaurs are the most familiar, but in the Triassic, there was a huge range of weird and wonderful animals. So, from looking at the specimen, we can rule out these things, and instead, pow, we've got a dinosaur. Can you beat that? So, let's say something about dinosaurs. So, one feature they all have, they're all very erect-limbed. Having these 
columnar type limbs enabled them to grow really big, the largest land animals. And they're all land living animals. There are no swimming aquatic dinosaurs, except if you count modern aquatic birds like penguins. Um, birds are dinosaurs attempt at being secondarily aquatic. But anyway, um, big split within dinosaurs is two main groups. On one side, you've got what are called the saurischians. That includes like carnivorous forms like theropods and herb long necked herb herbivores like sauropods. And the other big group are the ornithischians, the bird hips. Um, I think most people are familiar that birds are dinosaurs, but birds have absolutely nothing to do with ornithischians. This is just a bad word that we're stuck with from the 19th century. So birds have nothing to do with ornithischians. And within the ornithischians, you've got a lot of familiar animals like the stegosaurs and duckbills and horned dinosaurs. But we're interested in the ankylosaurs here. So another big split within, so this the group for, that includes stegosaurs and, um, and, and ankylosaurs is known as the Euripoda, or wide foot or wide feet. Um, and the other is the uh, ankylosauria, the name means fused reptiles. I'm pretty sure it refers to the fact that a lot of the time the armor in these guys is fused right onto the skull or their armor plates are fused together. And again, there's another big split within the ankylosauria you have the ankylosauridae, um, which have broad, tend to have very broad heads, wide mouths, and tail clubs. It's thought with these broad heads and mouth, they just basically inhaled all the vegetation in front of them. And in contrast, you've got the nodosaurs, who have very narrow heads and no tail club, and it's thought they were much more selective feeders, carefully picking out things. Um, I have to say, I really like ankylosaurs. I think the armor's great, the tail club's awesome and that the nodosaurs are just pathetic dinosaurs. <laughs> In fact, I'd almost want to call them naughty sores if anybody knows what that reference means. So I'm really hoping ours is, a, is an ankylosaur proper. Um, unfortunately, in the time period we're at, there's an awfully good chance it will be a naughty sore. So. But anyway, it's still, it's still a good specimen if it's not close to perfection. Um, this is what one of the pieces we saw, it's in the back of a pickup truck. You can see this dirty snow from the mine. And we everybody, you always have to wear gloves when you're there. So here's the things that we knew we, right away we had a truly exceptional thing. The armor's all nicely in place in rows. So often in ankylosaurs, the animals were quite rotten when they became buried. And the armor is in the skin, it becomes detached from the body and moves around. So every time you see a restoration of ankylosaur, it's pretty much an approximation of how the armor was thought to have been, but here we've got it fixed in place. The thing I really like is this preservation of scales and skin impressions. We can see this all over the body parts that we've looked at so far. No one's ever seen this before. We've also, just to get oriented, we're looking at a portion near the base of the back. Um, this is a cross section through a neural spine, one of the little pointy bits on your back. And paralleling each side, uh, we have these ossified tendons. Um, if you've ever had a turkey drumstick and you'll find these sort of plasticky semi-rigid portions in the lower leg these are those are ossified tendons um, because those tendons have to pull really hard on the feet and carry the weight of the bird if they weren't mineralized with bone they would just stretch but if they're mineralized they become rigid and can transmit a stress so it's the same thing going on in the backs of many ornithischian dinosaurs they have these ossified tendons and these big fat tendons here like Big as, thick as broom handles, tell me that we've, this animal may have been carrying a tail club. It had to really support its back some, for some reason. Other awesome thing is possible stomach contents or just or, and, and, uh, stomach stones. We've got a mix in here of what are genuine lithological rock artifacts like a quartzites. But then we've got these other weird shapes. I'll show you better pictures later on, but this is what we saw on that first day. And to top it off, we have an uncrushed three-dimensional skeleton. Normally dinosaur fossils are like two-dimensional fossils. They're squished flat and they're sheared. This thing is completely undisturbed. It's absolutely amazing that it retained the form it did. So this gives you an idea of the sort of animal we're dealing with. Um, it's based off Ankylosaurus, um, which comes from 
uh, Dinosaur Park, among other places. Um, so the, the armor forms like an outer shell in these things. And they've still got a full skeleton underneath. And in the region of the head, the armor often fuses onto the skulls. It actually makes the skulls quite difficult to interpret. So I want to say, when did this thing live? So this is a little time chart showing the Mesozoic period of middle life. It's bounded by the worst mass extinction at the bottom, the end Permian extinction, and then the end Cretaceous extinction, which most people know about. And in red, that's when dinosaurs form a prominent component of the land animals. So most of Alberta's dinosaurs come from the last 15, 20 million years of this Cretaceous period, things like Ankylosaurus. The earliest one of these armored dinosaurs, um, such the Thyreophorans, to be more inclusive group, are this thing called Skeletosaurus from the southern part of England about 200 million years ago. Uh, if you move forward in time a bit, there's a, a Nodosaur, another one from England. This is one of, one of the first three dinosaurs ever described. Um, is from the early Cretaceous of England, Hyliosaurus. And then our animal conveniently sits right in here. Um, the geology people at Suncor had worked out a very finely resolved time scale, and they were telling us that the horizon, this thing that was 113 million years old. So it's a nice intermediate between forms elsewhere. Um, there are some ankylosaurs, nodosaurs from the United States almost at the same time, a thing called Sauropelta, which was also found in a marine setting. But I'm Every, but I think our animals have the potential to say a lot more about these things just because of the completeness. So where did this thing live? So if you were to come to the Earth in your spacecraft about 115 million years ago on a very cloudless day, this is, you'd see something like this. Um, there was a British Columbia, hasn't quite assembled yet. Most of it's still off here. It's, North America has been growing along its western margin for a long time. Here's the province of Alberta. And you can see we're almost completely covered by this major land seaway that runs through it. And here's Fort McMurray. So what is a dinosaur? We found this dinosaur at Fort McMurray. What's a dinosaur doing way out at sea? And there's one thing about these maps. These are from Ron Blakey's website. They're awesome maps. They're really great in talks. But you can see there's all sorts of detail, especially over here. And I don't know if you know um, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Slarty Bartfast, who made the coastlines on continents. He would love these maps. But, <laughs> but you have to be careful when you look at these. They look great, but how much evidence is there? So here's a geological map, thanks to Dave Eberth, when I went and pestered him for this image. Um, so the, the yellowy green and the blue, these are sedimentary rocks from the last 600 million years. These are where we typically find the fossils in Western Canada. Here's Fort McMurray, right on the Athabasca River. It's actually, I couldn't get the stupid PowerPoint. The resolution's terrible. Fort McMurray is right at the junction, that triple point. But anyway, so Fort McMurray is well situated in these uh, sedimentary rocks. And there's this sharp boundary running across the continent. And this marks the edge of the sedimentary cover in, can, you know, in Canada here. So to the west, the rocks are younger than 600 million. And to the east, they're at least a billion years old, except for these, you know, there's some um, lower Paleozoics here. There's actually a bit of Cretaceous in northern Ontario. But anyway, our specimen is up here we have no idea of what the land was like over here. Those nasty glaciers and continental ice sheets that came and went over the last million years scraped away just about all this younger sedimentary cover. So when you see a Blakey map like this, you have to be really careful because here he's got little mountains here and lowland areas and coastline. It's a fiction. It's a nice fiction. Um, this, this side here is much better established, but this, you have to be careful. So let's zoom in on the province here, let's have a closer look. So here's Alberta again, almost fully underwater. And one of the reasons I think this animal had to have come from the west, there's several lines of evidence that I would use. First off, here's just to locate you geographically. For many decades from northeastern British Columbia and the extreme western edge of Alberta, 
there are, we've known about this series of trackways known as Tetrapodosaurus. It's an unfortunate name. Um, the name doesn't refer to any animal. It refers to these trackways. But everybody's agreed that they're tracks made by some sort of armored dinosaur. And we've got them at many locations all along the, edges of the eastern edges of the mountains. We also know from the geological evidence that there's been many great rivers have been flowing east, northeast out of these rising mountains, carrying huge amounts of silt and sands and muds and depositing them in this seaway here. So my thinking is the current best explanation for where our ankylosaur came, it was living on this plain here. It somehow got caught in a river. Maybe it was dead, maybe it drowned and got swept out to sea that way. We have no idea what was happening over to the northeast. Some of the people, geology people at Fort Mac, think they can see river delta. Um, there's some geological evidence for certain st structures that they may, there may have been land closer by. And they often find quite a bit of wood, uh, well-worn well wood, not nice trees and leaf, leaf impressions, but chunks of wood. Um, but I think it could just as easily have come from the west. So that's about 200 kilometers, that distance. So that's why I was saying, you know, four days at 50 kilometers, um, a day to drift to get out to that far. And that's why I have my little cartoon. This thing had to have floated on its back, as you'll see why we think that in the posture of the arms is also based on this specimen. This is a common mode of transport for large dead animals. So back to the spot where we were. There's a specimen stuck in the cliff. And if we look a bit closer, you can see how, why it's preserved the way it is. So all this clear water formation, it's very soft rock. And the teeth of the bucket scrape up nicely through just about all of it, except where our specimen is. You can see a change in the rock type. It goes from this soft, pliable stuff into this very hard, brittle, glass-like material. And the animal's lying on its back. So this is the, the top of the back right here. And the arms and legs are stuck up like I had in my drawing. It, the body must have been so bloated, the arms and legs are pushed out to the side. And this thing conveniently went down on, on its back. And I think if the body wall ruptured, there's no armor on the belly. That's probably the weakest part. It would have, the gas pressure from decay would build up. It went pop. And hydrodynamically, I think it went down perfectly flat and came to rest. And I think the seabed conditions were such that mineralization around the skeleton must have started extremely quickly to keep everything in place. And it's a really abrupt contact between the permineralized or wrap the solidified area and the surrounding rock. It really is an abrupt change. So first thing we had to do before we ever started digging down, we had to rescue all that material at the bottom. So we couldn't have people going in there. So Suncor got a couple of their best shovel operators, excavators. Seems people, a lot of the people there have worked there for decades. And um, the, they knew the ones that had the lightest touch for doing stuff. So we had this guy with his really long arm reach in, gently scoop out stuff, and then spread it out. And we went through all these layers. All the geology department there was pressed into helping. Um, we spent two days doing this, and we went through everything at least twice. I know I went through everything twice, all the rows, and everybody else was doing the same. And you just drag your geological hammer through this rubble, and you'd hear a clink, and that was told you when you hit this really hard mineralized stuff. In fact, you could do it by touch alone. The mineralized stuff is so dense and heavy compared to everything else, you could just pick it up, and then you'd look, up oh, bone, and you'd save it. And so we really wanted to leave no crumbs behind because it would be extremely frustrating. There's a specimen parked way up on the cliff there. So we got, this is the sort of material we recovered from the impact below the specimen. Um, you can see the fragments are very sharp edged, but the, the exposed bone surfaces like there and there, um, it, turned, it was very neat, clean breaks. You can also see it speckling there. It started to snow a little bit. On, on, this, on, this, on the specimens. So we got six pallets of this stuff. So we were really pleased. We figured we got everything that we could out of that. We were saving pieces down to about the size of a golf ball. 
if we could find them. Um, we had an awful lot of visitors all the time. And one of our worries was souvenir collectors. So we needed a really safe place to store the stuff. And they suggested, why not our fire hall? Um, so Suncor has their own fire department. And it's staffed 24 hours a day. They actually get quite a bit of business, surprisingly. And um, it was, that was a perfect place for it. And I, this place was absolutely immaculate. You could eat your floor off this floor, this, eat your dinner off this floor. It was so clean. And it was a great place to store stuff. And we packed everything up there. So once we were confident we had cleared away all the rubble at the base, we were able to bring in the bigger machines and start coming down to our specimen. Um, one of the highlights of this trip for me was I got to work this machine for about half an hour. Something I wanted to do since I was like four years old. It was great. Um, I'm sure glad I didn't turn it out to be a career option. It got pretty stale pretty quick. So, so we spent many days watching them carefully dig down. They had their best guys and people were competing to come and work on this. Because people had said, everybody just went out of their way to, to help us. It really was amazing. And people would come up and offer to do stuff for us and it was just too many people. That's why they had that security guy at the end there. We had 24 hour security on the site. There's our specimen there. We didn't want to come any closer with this bigger, rougher machine because you can see it's got these big fangs for busting up rock. So we, while that was going on, they also pushed in a ramp for us. They think nothing of moving small mountains there. And um, yeah, this ramp would probably, uh, this ramp space here would probably fill uh, this auditorium. And we were finally able to get up and see it. The specimen's there, we piled some gravel in front of it for protection. We then got a lighter machine, the same operator. The guy's name was Derek, I cannot remember his last name. Um, but he had a very light touch with the machine. Uh, we put a big four by eight sheet of plywood to protect it while he did his scraping. We were told that we had three weeks to get this thing out or else Suncor would start losing money. So this pressure was leaning on us all the time. You're torn between getting it out in a reasonable amount of time and not breaking it. We had all their facilities. Whatever we wanted, we just asked. And one of, when we first went there in March, um, as part of their routine, they, they laser scan all the cliffs. They, all, they want to know, ex they use that for calculating volumes of rock that need to be moved and processed. So they laser scanned that cliff before we even got there. But once we got it, the specimen all stripped clean for the surrounding rock, we had their survey people come in and give us a centimeter precise position. Um, they have a series of antennas all around their mine. And so this transmitter is communicating to their uh, receivers and get very precise location data. Another thing that they suggested was this hydraulic um, vacuuming. Normally, when we do it, we'd be down here with picks and shovels doing it by hand, but they told us about these uh, hydraulic, they call it daylighting, where they use a guy with a wand with super high pressure water and then an equally super strong suction. He cuts the rock with the water and it just sucks up into this super strong, strong vacuum. It's actually quite dangerous. This woman here is a nurse on permanent duty with every crew in case someone gets a hand or a foot sucked off. So that was... <laughs> And it's also super loud. The roar of this thing was amazing. But anyway, that worked a treat, and they got it stripped down for us. So everybody was convinced that the rock, because we'd seen the fragments, which seemed so strong, everybody was convinced, yeah, we can just lift it out. We saw there was a little bit of surface cracking, so we encased it with a mixture of burlap, and the only mortar-type material we could find was ready, bags of ready mix concrete. Myself and one of the Suncor guys, Bob Heron, we went to every hardware store and equipment and building supply place trying to find plaster of Paris. We could not find it. And people would look at us like we'd ask them for bazooka marbles or something. They had no idea what we were talking about. So we had to try stoop to this concrete ready mix. So they got, um, again, Suncor's got every big equipment thing you could wish for. They brought in this crane 
and a specialized crew to do it. Um, these guys knew exactly what they were doing for all sorts of heavy lifting. Suncor also arranged for a trucking company. And so the trucking company, when they were told how important it was, not just a driver, they sent like a foreman to come and supervise as well. So the, all these lifting guys are all, you know, many years experience. And he was like the head of lifting things. That was his <laughs> job. So we we so we'd thoroughly detached. We could see daylight underneath this, and they started to put the tension on it, and bang. I still get a terrible pit in my stomach when I see this. It turns what we've learned since is that the bone was extremely soft. The mineralization around it was so rapid that the rock was hard, but the bone is poorly mineralized, and it just this, there was no strength running through it. It actually split right down the middle of the animal. But a benef there was the way it broke because the bone was not super brittle. It was very clean breaks. And we were estimating this is probably about an eight to nine ton block. So as Doug Lacey said, it's probably a blessing in disguise that we've got some more manageable blocks. I don't think we could have managed an eight ton block in this place. To them, it's nothing, almost nothing. They still had a lot of guys there, but well, we had to recover from that. So we went back to standard procedure. Um, we had Jim McCabe did a heroic drive and brought us bags of FGR plaster, the fiberglass reinforced. Um, all the co-op students and interns were volunteered to come and help us. So we had one crew mixing plaster at one station. We had another crew cutting burlap and applying burlap to the plaster. Then people would roll it up and then they would take these snakes as we call them. That was one strategy we had for reinforcing. And we encased the remaining blocks. So we got everything secured, many layers. We only had one crappy weather day. Um, overnight it snowed, and it snowed a bit in the morning. It was cold, you can see how much people are wrapped up. But over the next day and a half it thawed out and things got very mucky and very soggy. But we, again, we had all the, all the toys to play with to help shift stuff. This is what they call the zoom boom. I think it's this boom that can zoom in and out. It was really handy and it was super maneuverable for turning in tight places to position stuff. Again, one of the benefits of a major industrial facility is their shipping and receiving place. They have all sorts of containers and packaging materials and ways to secure stuff, and people's job is just to pack stuff. Um, one thing that we were introduced to were these cocoa mats. Normally it's for dealing with the thousands of muddy boots in the place and going into buildings, but Turns out they're really good for packing heavy fossil material. Another thing they have are these super absorbent pads for dealing with chemical and oil spills. They're quite thick, maybe about five millimeters thick. And they had stacks and you know, hundreds and hundreds in plastic bags. They were really good for wrapping. And if you're putting a bunch of rocks in one box, you slip one of these pads in between to stop them rubbing. That was a, that was a great, great invention there. And again, they had like banding machines for securing stuff for the long trip. That was really good. So the final stages was to lift out the pieces. Um, we had them all, the smaller ones that we could get with the other tools or our hands came out separately, but we needed some more equipment. Um, and this, this guy was working in the area, so we just asked him to lift these blocks. So we got another flatbed truck. And we spent about two hours trying to position these blocks on the deck to get them stable and for strapping, and it just wasn't working. And then one of the mine geologists, Hans Heltke, said, what if we got some big pallets with rim, filled them with sand, and put the blocks on the sand? And that worked great. Then we had a stable platform, and we could fasten things down. Again, we brought in the magical zoom boom, and it loaded everything up for us. Everything got strapped down. Again, they've got no end of major timbers and straps and all sorts of things to fasten it. So here it was. This is a picture from yesterday. Uh, some of the materials in the big lab, 
Some of it's in the compound at the back, and the rest of it, if we could have the space, it's in unprepared. So everything you see on the floor in the boxes or on the pallets is part of our specimen. This is stuff from the cliff face. It was really crumbly, and we knew we had to save it before we started doing any of the heavy equipment work. So it all got, we divided up into the wall into sections, and we collected everything from one section, went in one box, and it was wrapped and, and bagged for, for, for travel. And one of the nice things about the packing place is they were able to wrap cellophane around collections of boxes on a pallet and keep it all together. And this, these are, here's, we're still in unprepared collections. These are the pieces that Sean Funk first saw um, when, he, when he realized he had something. That's my, my keys for scale. And so you can just see just how distinctive it is. We also have um, little bags of sand for when we're moving these pallets around in the museum. We don't want blocks shaking and moving against each other. There are some of those absorbent pads and sandbags keeping things propped up and separate. So here's Mark Mitchell. He's a preparator here in the museum. And Mark's first love is marine reptiles. His second love is armored dinosaurs. So he would be the, he's the perfect person to work on this specimen. And with this piece that he's worked on, it really shows us what we've got. So here's a close-up view. And I'll just take you through what we have here. So the first thing is the ribs. There's four of them here running across. So we're looking at the side of the body, uh, near, near the front of the animal. And it seems that the weight of mud was just enough on this thing to press the body down a bit. And parts of the backbone, the neural spines along the back, um, actually poked through the armor and went outside the body. Um, Mark's been working on this this week, although he's been moved over to our elasmosaur, I think, for a while. The other thing is the armor plates all nicely in position. And one thing I just noticed two days ago was that there's two plates fused together. Um, so if we find this on the other side of the body, that may just be part of it, the, model, the animal, how it grew. But if it's a one-off, we've clearly got a deformed animal and it's defective and we'll just have to chuck it and come back, <laughs> wait for another one. The other nice thing is the traces of scales and skin. I use them interchangeably. Um, Mark's done his best to try and preserve as much of the scale over it, but separation, the bone, and especially the armor, is extremely soft, and the rock is extremely hard. Mark's done an amazing job getting it to this state. So here's, here's another view of that specimen. And here's our little toy model. This is actually Ankylosaurus. Um, from the late Cretaceous, but the gift store had a whole bunch of them. And um, they're really good for, talk, for showing people. I took a bunch of these. I didn't take enough. I took them up north to the mine. And people that really went out of their way to help us, I gave them one of the models. And they're thrilled. I used them all up. So, so you've got this nice specimen. The question is, how long did it take Mark to prepare this? Anybody? OK, people that work here don't say. <laughs> okay, I'll so, well, let's, let's just work this out. Mark, he started it in October, so that's four months. And there's four months, four weeks in a month. And Mark's got other things to do, so he estimates he's probably spent four days a week on this, seven hours a day. Comes out to 448 hours. So let's say 450 for argument's sake. That's a lot of work. And the other sobering fact is we estimate this block represents about 5% of the whole fossil. So how long is it going to take us? So here's a little cartoon I did. Um, let's assume the main part of the body is an ellipsoid. So imagine like a flattened egg shape. Uh, divide that surface into eight sections. And so take 100% of the animal, divide it by eight. That gives you about 12.5%. Is that... And so this represents 12.5% of the total surface of the ellipsoid. If you figure you have to add in the surface area of the head and the limbs and the tail, that's, probably, that's going to lower that 12%. So you think that patch of animal, the patch of marks prepared, represents that patch in red on the actual thing. 
So if we're saying that's 5% of the total animal, and 20 times 5 gives you, five, gives you 100%, 450 hours times 20 is 9,000 hours. That's almost nine years. So Mark is going to be tied to this thing for the next nine years. <laughs> But it also tells us we're going to have to get, if we've been telling people this thing will take three years to get done. Uh, we're going to have to get some more people on this. Or the, the 9,000 hours, just, just not on. Um, let's have a one last look at the details of the specimen. What really amazes me is why is everything the way it was in life except it's replaced by rock? So here's cross sections through the ribs of that piece that we've been looking at. And you can see there's a separation between the rib and the skin and the armor. So there was muscle and fat and other skin and connective tissue in there. Why wasn't it squished down like a typical fossil? So we already got a really nice spatial sense for how this animal was put together. And I'm thinking that the armor would have looked something like this. This is the thorny devil from Australia. Um, and the armor in this little guy, this thing's only about this big. Um, these armor, these spines, they're supported by bone that grew in the skin. And I think something like this will be a good model for trying to understand the armor on these things. And I think with the quality of this armor here, we can do a lot more with thin sections, like looking under the microscope and seeing how it grew and developed. And we can also relate the skin, this epidermal stuff, that relates to these osteoderms, the bony plates in the skin. Here's a cross section through we think might be a hand. The hands and feet in ankylosaurs are really poorly known. Um, they were like the first things to fall off when these animals were rotting. But we've got here five bones. So we've got five bones in our hands. Some ankylosaurs have five in the hand, some don't. So that's probably cross section through a hand. Well, here's a section through a foot. Uh, we're still not sure what we've got exactly. So this fat bone on the end might be part of an ankle. It might be part of the bottom end of the shin. We certainly got a, a long part of the foot bone, one of the metatarsals. And then we've got two toe bones perfectly articulated. You can see that's where the cartilage was, right between the two bone surfaces, and again here. So when this get, one of our things for doing this, or our plans for preparing this, is not to take all the bone out. We're going to concentrate on doing the armor and the external surface first, and probably leave it. CT technology has come along so rapidly in the last 10 years. I think it's best to wait and we'll CT scan this thing and sort of dissect it digitally. Um, I don't want my academic descendants cursing me or anybody else here for having messed it up by rapidly burrowing in. I think we'll expose the surface and see how nice in 3D and that will make a great display, but I think we should be patient before we start worrying about the insides. It's too valuable. Oh, well, that's probably the other end of a toe bone. So here, here's a picture of these possible stomach contents or stomach stones. And we've got, you can see, where's, where's some nice normal? That's probably a normal pebble. You can see them for sure on, the, on the, uh, the blocks. That's a normal pebble. But then you've got these weird things. Um, I was wanting to call them piezolites, which is a sedimentary structure that forms from grains get coated. But the internal structure of these things is very weird. They're not built up like hailstones or anything like that. So we will, I think we'll have to do one bit of destructive testing on this. We're going to have to cut out a little square and make a thin section. You glue the piece onto, uh, glue the sample onto glass, grind it down so thin you can shine light through it. And that will be, I think, the definitive way to really understand what these are. Well, one other thing, this black crud is probably skin. On the, on the belly side of the animal, we've got this black veneer all over it, which is probably a um, type of skin. So um, that's all I can tell you about this specimen for now. Um, I really do have to acknowledge these people listed on, this, on the screen here. But I think these two at Suncor, the, the super Doug here and his right-hand man, Bob Heron, these guys went out of their way. They were there every day for the three weeks we were there. Um, Doug's one of these super overachiever type guys. And um, he kept saying, I've got all these favors to call in. And he, and he knew the mine system inside out and backwards. 
So he was able to really make things happen for us. And Bob was the ultimate gopher. Um, he drove us everywhere, and if we needed something, he'd drive all the way back to town, 30 kilometers, to go and get it for us. Um, they, really, they really did a, a great job. And um, yeah, so check back with us in a couple of years, and we'll be able to tell you how we've been getting on with the preparation. And I'll take any questions that you have. <laughs>